Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Uh, my name is Abby Edens. I'm Director of Education here at the National World War II Museum, and I want to welcome you to our Lunchbox Lecture Program. Today's program is made possible by our sponsor, AARP Louisiana. Our presenter today is Barry Simon. Uh, in this lecture, we're going to be exploring the torpedoing and sinking of the SS Dorchester, as well as the four American chaplains from different denominations who unselfishly sacrificed their own lives to save others. Barry is also going to present a brief overview on the submarines that were built in Wisconsin at Mantawak, tested on Lake Michigan, and then barged uh, through the locks at Chicago. From there, they made their way over to and then down the Mississippi River, where they were partially rebuilt and recommissioned in New Orleans before sailing off to war. So without further ado, I'm going to be turning this over to Barry. Good morning or good afternoon, depending upon where you are. My name, once again, is Barry Simon. I am a docent and volunteer here at the National World War II Museum in New Orleans. I've been doing this for almost nine years and have done uh, several lectures for the museum. The, the topic this morning, as was said, is, is actually two topics. One, the four chaplains of the SS Dorchester, and the other, the uh, freshwater submarines from Manitowoc, Wisconsin. Now, the immortal chaplains, many people might recognize this image. This might be your only familiarity with the story of the four chaplains. There are a number of videos and information online that you can uh, research, and I do recommend that. Uh, they can get pretty emotional when you, when you see those videos. I think mine is a little bit more cut and dry, but I will give you a good overview of what happened. Once again, this program will chronicle the events surrounding the sinking of the SS Dorchester on February 3rd, 1943, as well as the actions of the four army chaplains on board who sacrificed their lives in an effort to save others. This is the Dorchester. The, the, the Dorchester was a coastal passenger steamer, which was first commissioned in the uh, mid 1920s. It was only 368 feet long, which, which is approximately the length of the Fletcher class destroyer USS Kidd, which is berthed about 70 miles upriver from New Orleans at Baton Rouge. Uh, the kid's actually a few feet longer, but this ship uh, configured in uh, uh, civilian or passenger service to hold about 350 people in wartime with army uh, cots and so forth on the ship would hold about 900 people. She was requisitioned and operated by the War Shipping Administration, the WSA in January of 42 as a troop ship reconfigured to army standards. Uh, when torpedoed, she was part of convoy SG-19 that had sailed from New York to Greenland via Newfoundland. The torpedoing took place approximately 150 miles south of Cape Farewell on the extreme southern shore of Greenland. She was hit on the starboard side and sank by the bow approximately 20 minutes after the torpedo hit. 674 of the 900, uh, 904 aboard perished, many dying in the 34 degree water temperature. 230 survivors were pulled from the frigid water by the Coast Guard cutters Escanaba and Comanche. Some more specifics on the ships that escorted this convoy. Uh, at this time in World War II, approximately a year after the United States got into the war, ships were requisitioned or pulled from other services. The two ships that you see on the right, the Escanaba and the Comanche, were only 165 feet long and for uh, their lives up to this point were actually Coast Guard cutters on Lake Michigan. So they were not used to sailing between between uh, Newfoundland and Greenland in a convoy role. The ship on the left is even a little bit older, the USS Tampa, which had been requisitioned and taken from the Coast Guard and put into Navy service. It was a bit larger. All of these ships, as you can see, are relatively slow. And the speeds that you see up here are actually uh, a very generous estimation of their speed during wartime. They all needed overhaul. Uh, radar and sonar equipment was, was suspect if even existed as, at all. As you can see, the ship on the right, the Comanche, had no radar or sonar until 1945. They did have radar direction finding, and there's conflicting evidence as to whether or not radar or sonar was used. Some sources say yes, some say no. This shows the Dorchester in uh, uh, her civilian role as a coastal passenger steamer. This is from a, a postcard. You can see 
She looks much like a typical passenger ship at that time, albeit a, a bit smaller. The other ships that were in the convoy, the other two merchant ships along with the Dorchester were the SS Lutz and SS Biscaya, and they were leased by the United States from the Norwegian government in exile. This shows the chaplains. This is from a painting that was commissioned for one of the videos that was uh, shot. And uh, on from left to right, you've got Lieutenant Good. He's a Jewish rabbi on board. Uh, in the middle, Lieutenant Fox and Lieutenant uh, Pauling represented various uh, Protestant denominations. And on the right is Lieutenant J.P. Washington, who is a, a Catholic priest. All of these men were, uh, with the exception of Lieutenant Fox, who was 42 years old, all of these men were in their 30s. Lieutenant Good, the rabbi, son of a rabbi, born in Brooklyn, raised in Washington. He was married in 1935 to a Teresa Flax, who is quite interesting. She was a niece of Al Jolson. They had one daughter. She became, uh, he became a rabbi in uh, 1937 after graduating from Hebrew Union College. He received his PhD from John Hopkins in 1940, and he served as a rabbi in Marion, Indiana and York, Pennsylvania. In 1941, he founded Boy Scout Troop 37 in York, a multicultural mixed race troop and the first troop in the United States to have scouts earn Catholic, Jewish and Protestant awards. Initially turned down to become a Navy chaplain in 41, he reapplied to the Army's chaplain program in 42. He then studied at the Army's chaplain school at Harvard and then briefly served at an air base in Goldsboro, North Carolina. In October of 1942, he joined the other three chaplains with plans to later embark on the Dorchester a few months later. Our next chaplain, Lieutenant George Fox, was a Methodist uh, pastor. He was born in 1942, one of five children. At age 17, he ran away to join the army and he served as a medical orderly on the Western Front during the First World War. He earned the Silver Star, the Purple Heart and the Croix de Guerre for his service. Upon returning home, he finished high school. Let me backtrack for a second, uh, tell them about something he did during World War I. He was a, a, a medical ambulance driver and at one point during one uh, uh, engagement, everybody was wearing gas masks because of poisonous gas. Two soldiers were injured on the battlefield. They did not have their gas masks. He ran out there. He recovered one man, taking his gas mask off, giving it to the soldier and bringing him to safety. He then returned with the gas mask, put it on the other soldier and brought him to safety. That's why he earned that silver star and the Croix de Guerre. Upon returning home, he finished high school. He married in uh, 1923 and had two children, a boy and a girl. Uh, his son later joined the Marine Corps the same day that Fox enlisted in the army. Uh, Fox became a Methodist minister in, uh, or preacher in 1931. He became an ordained minister in 34. He uh, became minister of a church in Vermont. And while there in Vermont, he became the state chaplain and historian for the American Legion. And like the others, he rejoined the army in 1942, having previously served during World War I. Our third chaplain, Lieutenant Clark Poling, also a Protestant pastor, born in Columbus, Ohio. His father was a minister. His father later uh, converted to the Baptist faith, becoming an ordained minister. And in high school, Poling excelled in football. He later attended Rug Rutgers University. I'm not sure if he played football there, but he did graduate in 1933. He then went on to Yale Divinity School, graduated in 1936, took a position as a pastor of the first reformed church in Schenectady, New York, where he settled with his wife, wife Elizabeth Jung and their son Clark. A, a daughter was born later, Susan Elizabeth, and she was born three months after Lieutenant Poling's death. At the outbreak of 1941, Poling immediately volunteered for service as an army chaplain in the footsteps of his father who served as a chaplain in World War I. He initially served in Mississippi with the transport regiment. Our final pastor, Lieutenant John Washington, was a Catholic priest. He was one of seven children. His parents were Irish immigrants. He was religious from a young age and that stems from the fact that 
at one point he was close to death. I'm not sure from what ailment, but he was given the last rites. Uh, that uh, experience uh, made him very religious. He was an altar boy. Uh, later, he was uh, in, New in Newark, New Jersey. He did very well in school and was accepted in the Seton Hall Prep School where he completed high school and took courses designed to prepare him for, for priesthood. Following graduation from high school, he moved to the Immaculate Conception Seminary School of Theology at Seton Hall University. He became a minister in 1936. He served at several New Jersey parishes over the next six years before joining the army after the attack on Pearl Harbor. Brief periods of service in Indiana and Maryland, he was dispatched to Harvard University in 1942, where he took a course preparing him for deployment for Europe, where he first met the other three chaplains. Now, one thing that's come out on several of the videos that are available online was his, his joking nature. You, you wouldn't think of him with that serious look on his face as being a jokester, but he was. And very good as all of the chaplains were with the men on board ship. They, they offered a lot of comfort to them. And they even had a, uh, a show, I believe the night before the, uh, the sinking of the ship, kind of a talent show where they were the people with the talents entertaining the troops. One other point on the ship, uh, some soldiers were playing cards and one, uh, one soldier called uh, Lieutenant Washington over to bless his cards. Washington took a look at his cards and said, and I can't, I'm not even going to try to imitate an Irish accent, but in an Irish accent, he basically told the soldier, son, I'm not going to, I'm not going to bless a pair of threes. <laughs> So now let's turn to uh, uh, the, the submarine that did the attack on the Dorchester. Uh, the submarine U-223 was a uh, uh, class 7C U-boat. Uh, this was the most numerous class in, in World War II. 568 units were completed. They were relatively small ships with a length of only 220 feet and a displacement of almost 770 tons. Uh, they could dive to a very deep depth. If you compare them to American submarines at the time, 750 feet was a recommended max depth, although there's uh, uh, historical data that said that many of them went far below that without being crushed. 950 feet is shown here. Four torpedo tubes forward and one aft. Uh, the speed on the surface was about 17 knots. The speed submerged was about seven knots, uh, and that's a little bit over one mile per hour. Uh, because of that, it's, it's thought that the submarine approached the convoy on the surface from the rear. Uh, the convoy once again had relatively slow speed. So the submarine on the surface could catch up to the, to the convoy. Now this shows the, uh, the route of the convoy. Uh, New York's not in the picture, it would be over to the bottom left. So the a convoy went up along the East Coast and uh, docked once at uh, St. John's, Newfoundland, as you can see where the yellow line starts and then essentially getting further and further north into colder and colder waters. And once again, this is January, late January, early February. So the middle of winter on rough seas uh, that uh, the route covered about a thousand miles and took approximately to the point where the Dorchester was sunk about uh, four or five days. This diagram shows the relative position of the ships at the time of the Dorchester sinking. You can see the larger of the escort ships, the Tampa was out ahead 3,000 yards ahead of a line made up of the three troop ships, the Biscay, the Dorchester, and the Lutz. Uh, the Tampa was about 3,000 yards ahead of the uh, convoy ships. 3,000 yards is uh, almost two miles, a little bit short of two miles ahead. And the other escort ships, the Comanche and the Escanaba, were about 5,400 yards uh, behind the convoy ships, a little bit off to the, uh, the flanks. So 5,400 yards is approximately three miles. Uh, there's some confusion as to the time the Dorchester was sunk. The Samuel Elliott Morrison book on uh, the Battle of the Atlantic gives the time at 3.55 a.m. Other sources give the time of the torpedo in at 12.55 a.m. So that's a difference of three hours. 
Uh, my thinking is that they were uh, giving the time in relative times for the time zones that they were in. Can't be sure of that, but that's my, my theory on that. At 3.58, three minutes after the torpedo and the abandoned ship order was given, as the Dorchester was sinking rapidly by the bow. As I've stressed before, the water temperature was 34 degrees, air temperature was 36. The ship was listing heavily to starboard. That meant that the ships on the port, or the lifeboats on the port side of the ship couldn't be easily launched. And those on the, the right side of the ship, the davits holding the lifeboats were encrusted and covered in ice and they were hard to break free. Very few lifeboats made it to the water in one piece. Once they made it to the water, they were quickly overloaded and floundered. So the, the men on board the lifeboats had to deal with 34 degree temperature water inside the boats. Uh, of the complement on board the Dorchester, 904, 674 perished and 230 survived. This is a depiction of the, uh, of the uh, Dorchester going down. As you can see, the rudder of the ship off to the left with the propeller. Uh, lights are, that soldiers had both in the water and on the ship are illuminating the ship. The ship went down in approximately 20 minutes of time. This image shows the four chaplains all with a serious yet serene look on their faces, uh, essentially getting ready to sacrifice themselves for the sailors who did not have life jackets. There were life jackets in some lockers that they uh, tried to give the ships. The soldiers were encouraged to sleep below decks in full gear with life jackets on because of the danger of U-boats, including their coats. Many did not do that. It was too uncomfortable in a, a small bunk in, in crowded bunk areas. So here are the chaplains giving up their life jackets to some sailors. Another depiction of the ship going down, you can see the sailors had, had small lights and uh, some of the water also had lights. You can see a broken lifeboat in the water as it's going down. The seas not only were they cold, but they were rough. The chaplains uh, reading from their prayer books, singing hymns, uh, comforting one of the uh, soldiers to the left who was getting ready to jump into the water. Many of them did not want to jump into the water. This is a, another image of the, the rabbi and the priest and the pastors singing uh, hymns and praying together arm in arm on the deck of the ship as the ship was going down. This uh, painting uh, shows the Coast Guard cutter Escanaba. Uh, once again, I said this was 165 foot long ship. So it's approximately twice as long as the PT boat that the museum here refurbished and uh, put on water a few years back. So it's, uh, it's there administering to people. And one of the lieutenants on board the Escanaba, a Lieutenant Robert Prouse, uh, he served on board and he developed a specialized rescue system which, which was essentially tethered sailors or swimmers wearing rubber exposure suits, uh, called them wetsuits. And they were in the water. Uh, the wetsuits would help protect them from uh, going numb quickly. And they pulled sailors that were in the water, some of them totally helpless, as you can see some bodies floating in the water. Those people may not be dead yet, uh, but they were completely numb. In fact, the Escanaba pulled 50 people out of the water that they thought were dead initially, but only 12 were dead. Once they, uh, they received warmth uh, and treatment, uh, they did recover. Now the Escanaba herself, she was torpedoed or hit by a mine approximately five months later and went down with nearly all hands. Only two people survived from the sinking of the Escanaba. This is one of the first prototypes, if you will, of the stamp that was issued in 1948. It shows the, uh, the four chaplains above, uh, kind of a crude uh, image of the four chaplains. Uh, this one was rejected, but this is really the only one that had the ship depicted correctly, going down by the bow with the stern up in the air. This is a later prototype or re uh, revision of the stamp, which uh, the ship itself shows it as it appears on the final stamp with the uh, 
the chaplains holding hands or arm in arm with the word in the immortal chaplains interfaith and action, which was the same wording on the final version of the stamp, which is shown here. Now, uh, each of the four chaplains was awarded the posthumously the distinguished service cross for their action, as well as the purple heart. The chaplains had been recommended for the Congressional Medal of Honor, but were found to be ineligible as they had not engaged in combat with the enemy. Instead, an act of Congress established the Four Chaplains Medal on July 14, 1960, with the same weight and importance as the Medal of Honor. Four medals were presented posthumously to the next of kin by the Secretary of the Army at Fort Myer, Virginia on January 14, 1961. An issuance of this stamp was unusual because until 2011, American stamps were not issued to honor someone other than a US president until at least 10 years after his or her death. And then my information sources for this program once again was the Department of Defense video for chaplains of the USAT Dorchester with narration. And that is available on YouTube. I encourage everybody to look at that. It has some uh, emotional moments in that video that I, I just cannot convey in the program here today. Also, as I said before, history of the United States Naval Operations in World War II by Samuel Elliott Morrison, volume one, The Battle of the Atlantic, pages 331 to 334. And I'm gonna take a brief pause to drink some water, but this is the first slide in the next program, which we will get into in just one second. And all questions will, for both programs will be held to the end. Now, one of the hardest things to do about this program is to learn how to correctly pronounce the name Manitowoc. I was corrected about that here at the museum by some people from Wisconsin uh, a while back. And uh, fortunately, there's some pronunciation guides on the, on the internet that I refer to, to. And I still have to practice it. I want to tend to fall into another pronunciation. But, once again, the 28 submarines built in Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and they passed this spot on their way to war. Now, I tried to, to look up uh, this bridge, this opening drawbridge, uh, both using Google images and any images I could find online of both uh, Manitowoc, Wisconsin, and also Chicago, Illinois, because they did have to go uh, under many bridges on their way down to New Orleans. Here, but I could not identify this bridge. I don't know if it's, it still exists. Maybe somebody out there can, uh, can help out with that. Um, anyway, what encouraged me to do this program is like many of you, you probably stumbled across an image of a Manitowoc submarine being launched. It's a, a harrowing yet interesting spectacle. This shows one of the ships This actually is the first one being launched, the Pito, and uh, uh, I'll get more into the story of, uh, of the launching of the submarines in a second. But uh, first, we want to talk about why Man Manitowoc, why a, uh, a uh, small town on the coast, uh, the west coast of Lake Michigan, far removed from any ocean, why in the world would a town like this be utilized to launch a submarine. And this image shows the approximate location of Manitowoc, Wisconsin. And you can see its proximity to Green Bay, Wisconsin, uh, probably approximately about 50 miles away uh, across the uh, Green Bays at the bottom of the, the Door Peninsula, which is part of Wisconsin. That's that arm of Wisconsin jutting up into Lake Michigan. So why were submarines built here as a freshwater lake far removed from any ocean and with no easy way to get to an ocean? So the questions are why, when, and how? I'll answer these questions and share some images with you to document these answers. So here's why. Manitowoc, Wisconsin, on the western shore of Lake Michigan, north of Chicago, and not too far from Green Bay, Wisconsin, started as an Indian fishing village called Moondock the home of the good spirit. The name became Manitowoc in 1836 and shipbuilding began here shortly after that. The Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company started here in the early years of the 20th century. This next image shows 
the uh, Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company at the time of the uh, building of the submarines during World War II. And if you look carefully off to the left, uh, vertically away from us at the lower end of the screen, you see a, a submarine up on the ways in an earlier stage of construction. Down below that are two submarines next to each other that have already been launched there in the water, being fitted out prior to commissioning and uh, at the time that they were probably getting ready to go on shakedown or builders trials. Uh, to the right of those two submarines, you see another submarine uh, angled away from us, stern closest to that third submarine, bow looking away. And immediately in front of that is another submarine. So that's, uh, that's one, two, three, four, five in the picture. And above that and back toward the middle of the screen is, is something else. I'm not sure if that's a submarine or an oar boat that's being uh, worked on at the shipyard, one of the two. Uh, the shipyard diversified over the years, always finding various shipbuilding projects. In the early 1930s, however, it was lean years. By the late 30s, business was picking up. Some of the ship built with the Coast Guard cutter Electra, which later became President Roosevelt's yacht. Another Manitowoc built boat, the Potomac, was eventually sold to Elvis Presley. And the majority of the business was devoted to the building of car ferries and oar boats for service on the Great Lakes. With the impending war, Mr. Charles West, president of the company, approached the Navy about building destroyers and then having them floated down to the Gulf of Mexico via the Illinois and Mississippi rivers. The Navy did not award a contract for that, but with the war approaching and with more submarine building capacity needed, a submarine building contract was eventually awarded the U.S. Navy originally contracted Manitowoc Shipbuilding Company to construct 10 submarines for the war. Now this uh, image shows uh, and compares our fleet submarines, the two most numerous classes we had in World War II. The first of the Gato class, the second of the Ballo class. Now, uh, let me just say that American submarines at this time in the 1930s and, and through the the war years were all named after fish or sea creatures uh, or mythical sea creatures. One of the Manitowoc submarines built was the SS Kraken, which is a, uh, a, a mythological creature, a large sea serpent, if you will. Others were named after uh, sea tortoises and other things. So not entirely fish, but always connected to the sea in some way. Uh, below that, you'll see that once again, that class 7C U-boat, uh, you can see the size differential between our subs. Most of our fleet subs in World War II, particularly the Gato and the Ballo class were a bit over 300 feet long. Uh, the Gato class, 300 feet, 11, uh, 311 feet, 8 inches long. Uh, the Ballo class, approximately the same length, 300 feet, 311 feet, 8 inches long. The major difference between these two classes of ships is that the later Ballo class was built with a thicker steel hull. And because of that, it could dive to greater depths without being crushed. You can see the Gatto class was certified to 300 feet. The Ballo class was certified to 311 feet. Now up at uh, Manitowoc, the uh, submarine that they have there, the Cobia, is a Gato class submarine, but quite interestingly, it was not built in Manitowoc. It was uh, it was built by electric boat on the East Coast uh, in uh, in uh, Groton, Connecticut. And the major way you can tell these submarines apart, if you notice those holes uh, where the the hull of the ship changes colors, that's basically at the waterline. Those are called scupper holes. And in front of the bridge, depending upon where the subs were built, uh, it, it, the, uh, the Gato class boats had a, a double row, a parallel row of scupper holes. Those were built, uh, uh, the double hole ones were built at Mare Island and at the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard. The, the electric boat and the Manitowoc scupper holes were a single row of hulls from the, the bridge forward to the front. Now, many of the ship captains would add additional hulls to their ships because having more scupper hulls would let water in to 
to flood the boat more rapidly, to dive a little bit quicker. And uh, captains, much like PT boat skippers, were very good at customizing their ships. The gun configurations would change. You'll see on that Gato class boat, that gun forward of the bridge, that's a three inch gun that was first fitted. Many of the ship captains felt that that was inadequate for any surface attacks. They were later substituted, as you can see, in that Valo class boat that had a four inch gun, both in front of the superstructure and behind the superstructure. Those were essentially the same type of guns that were on our four stack World War I destroyers, many of which were uh, transferred to Britain under lend lease. That gun too was really not quite uh, the correct gun for submarine warfare. They were really not uh, designed as waterproof guns, a lot of grease in uh, critical spots was necessary to waterproof them as best they could. Later submarines were finished with a five inch 25 caliber gun, which was a bit more powerful than either of the two guns depicted here. So highly customized uh, submarines. Another way to tell the difference between a Gato class boat and a, a built in a Mar an electric boat and Manitowoc is the anchor was on the starboard or the right side of the bow in the uh, uh, other ships that were built at Bear Island and Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, the anchors were on the left side of the port side of the bow. The submarine that is uh, available for people from New Orleans to see most readily in Mobile, Alabama, the drum was actually the first Gato class submarine commissioned SS-228 and its uh, anchor uh, recess and anchor is on the left of the port side of the boat. So another depiction of a, a Gato class submarine built at Manitowoc being launched. As you can see, it was a, a, a very entertaining uh, site for the local populace. You'll see on the opposite bank of the river, uh, numerous people from the town watching this launching. This, uh, this was uh, one of the, not one of the first class, first class, but this is about ship number seven or eight in the process. This is the Robala, which is one of the four uh, Manitowoc built submarines that was sunk during World War II. And you can see it's, uh, it looks quite dangerous in a sense with the way the ship would fall into the water uh, with a big splash. And uh, one thing that's interesting about this in terms of uh, Manitowoc as a shipbuilding force, uh, something that uh, uh, various services that build skyscrapers or, or ships for the Navy should be aware of today. Uh, it, that's one thing that was always typical is to keep on schedule. Uh, it was always, and it's always been difficult to keep uh, ahead of time and under budget. Manitowoc was a follow yard to electric boat. The 28 submarines were built to their plans. Manitowoc relied on their experience, especially early on. They were innovators. The boats were built in sections and then assembled on the shipway. The boats were launched into the narrow channels of the Manitowoc River sideways. It looked scary, but it worked. And once again, check out some YouTube videos. You'll be amazed at the way some of this stuff looks. Here's another depiction from the aft end of a ship being launched. You see a man uh, right in the middle bottom of the picture watching the whole thing and a couple of other guys off to the side. All was safe, a lot of floating timber in the water, but the submarine came through pretty much unscathed. And this, once again, this is the Robalo after launch and uh, draw your attention to the people in the opposite bank of the river that had just watched this whole process. Now Lake Michigan, how did it work out in terms of being a good place to test submarines? Once again, it's a freshwater lake. So buoyancy is a bit different between a freshwater lake and, and the ocean, which is salt water. Uh, lake Michigan though did have a depth which made it adequate to test submarines. Uh, mean depth of 279 feet and a maximum depth of 925 feet. So they had to be aware of, of where the shallow spots were, but they could get out to deeper water to do their test dives. Lake Pontchartrain here in New Orleans would not be a place where anybody would want to test a submarine where our average depth is about 15 feet. Now, once launched, the boats were completed and then began several months of long process of builders shakedown trials. 
prior to both commissioning and thereafter, all being done in Lake Michigan, as I said, and it didn't matter time of year, summer, fall, winter, or spring, uh, not as deep as the ocean, as I said, and the, the trimming of the ships was different. One of the big challenges, as you can see here, was winter. Uh, this is not something you normally associate with the submarine, but a lot of ice could build up on the boats. Another depiction of the submarine during the wintertime with actually sheets of ice floating on the water of Lake Michigan with ice all over the boat itself. Now this is a commissioning ceremony of the Roballo in September 28, 1943 photo courtesy of the U.S. Naval Historical Center. Now the first boats, not the Roballo, but the first boats were commissioned in Manitowoc. Then when they were ready to sail down to Chicago, they were decommissioned only to be recommissioned again in New Orleans. The first uh, several boats, the, the first boat, the Pito, followed by the Pogi, uh, this was done. And then from what I could find, the only other boat that was done this way, it skipped a few boats, but the Rasher, which was the most decorated uh, Manitowoc built submarine in World War II, this was done in her case as well. This is a, a good depiction of uh, Lake Michigan off to the right, showing the various bridges that had to be opened uh, for the uh, submarines to come out. Uh, you can see in the center of the picture that wide area, that's essentially the Manitowoc shipbuilding yard. Uh, the boats were built around that peninsula, if you will. And then uh, they sailed out uh, almost on a daily basis once they were completed and undergoing shakedown trials for various tests out on the waters of Lake Michigan. This next image shows the relative position of, of Manitowoc to Green Bay. Green Bay is not labeled, but it's at the, uh, at the uh, terminus of the Door Peninsula and that little uh, uh, inlet of Lake Michigan, which comes down to that uh, kind of squarish looking uh, boxy area of, uh, of roadway around Green Bay, Wisconsin. On, a, on an image, I, uh, I blew it up. I tried to find the stadium where Green Bay plays, but I never could find it on the image, but it's gotta be there somewhere because this is a relatively recent uh, Google Earth image. Now, as I said, once the subs were completed and commissioned, and then in some cases decommissioned, they were sailed from Manitowoc overnight down to Chicago, Illinois, past Milwaukee, past Kenosha, I uh, passed a lot of other places. Once again, winter, spring, summer, or fall, it didn't matter what time this took place. And, and the, the journey from Mammoth to walk down to New Orleans and then out in the Gulf was, was kept in relative secrecy. They didn't want a lot of publicity about this. Uh, at the time, the first submarine sailed out into the Gulf of Mexico uh, through uh, South Pass, south of New Orleans. This was just a month after what ultimately turned out to be the last reported sighting of a German U-boat in the Gulf of Mexico. Now, from the point of the first submarine sailing out into the Gulf to the last, there were no further sightings or, or sinkings by German U-boats in the Gulf of Mexico. So once in Chicago, you'll see in this image, you'll see up in the top, you'll see the uh, Chicago Sanitary and Ship Canal, which uh, the boat sailed into uh, up to the Chicago River, which is off to the left, that uh, uh, narrow rectangular area above that entrance into the Ship uh, Canal is Navy Pier, for any of y'all who've been to Chicago. And down near the bottom, that circular whitish thing, that's the, uh, that's the Shed Aquarium. And then off to the right of it, jutting out into the lake that also circular drive around it. That's the Adler Planetarium. So uh, this is depicts various bridges. The subs would sail on their own with the bridges going up. Uh, one of the reasons why the subs were decommissioned is that to get under those bridges, some of which didn't open, they had to take off the periscope shears. They had to take off the periscope, some of the radar mass. They had to make the profile of the ship as low as possible. And this also tells me why the Navy rejected the, uh, the proposal that uh, Manitowoc build destroyers. A destroyer, the, the superstructure, even with the, the mast off would be much higher than a 
a submarine superstructure. There's no way without modification of all these bridges that uh, those ships could get through these uh, uh, canals, channels, and rivers to get to the Mississippi to get down to New Orleans. So once here, they would have to sail uh, on their own 34 miles uh, under a total of 58 bridges. And at that point, 34 miles from the edge of Lake Michigan, they would be met by a towboat that would, uh, they would be our floating dry dock, if you will, pushed by a towboat that would take them the rest of the journey. Now this shows the Pito being uh, loaded onto uh, the uh, floating dry dock at night. Uh, you see the searchlights on, you see that there's no evidence of periscopes or radar masts on the upper superstructure of the ship. And it's loaded at night. And uh, next image shows the Pito being transported down the Illinois waterway aboard the floating dry dock. And here's another one on board uh, the floating dry dock being taken down the river. So from the, uh, uh, the sewerage canal, if you will, sewerage channel to the Chicago River, eventually to the Des Plaines River, eventually to the Illinois River, and finally out just north of uh, St. Louis, Missouri and Alton, Illinois from the Illinois River into the Mississippi River. And uh, during the course of that journey, culminating at Alton, Illinois, there were uh, eight docks or eight, uh, eight uh, canals that they had to go through. In red highlighted here shows a journey from Chicago to the terminus of the Illinois River at the Mississippi River, just, uh, just upriver from Alton, Illinois with the final, the final uh, lock being at uh, Alton, Illinois. The passage in places, some of the straighter places were often quite narrow, 100 feet wide. And some other places along the Illinois River were roughly about 300 feet wide, but it, it wasn't the easiest thing to do. And a floating dry dock with high walls doesn't, uh, doesn't turn on a dime. Uh, any kind of wind or any kind of current would make it quite a challenge to uh, negotiate these winding rivers. Now, once in New Orleans, uh, the boats were offloaded from the dry docks and finished out at the Algiers Naval Shipyard. Uh, periscope shears, periscopes, and radar assemblies had to be reassembled. In addition, the boats had to be fueled and had to have stores, including gun ammunition and torpedoes loaded. And from New Orleans, they could finally now sail on their own with river pilots aboard down the pilot town where the river pilot left and a bar pilot took over the final trip to the Gulf of Mexico through South Pass. Pito, the first Manitowoc sub, had a bar pilot aboard who had already been on ships torpedoed twice, exiting the Mississippi River into the Gulf of Mexico. That X marks the position of pilot town. Most ships today exit the Mississippi River via Southwest Pass, which is dredged to a deeper depth. But at the time of World War II, the submarine's draft was such that it could, they could go down through South Pass. And this is an aerial view showing the South Pass directly ahead, uh, Southwest Pass off to the right. Now, this, the topic today was not about the uh, actual exploits of the 28 submarines during World War II. I, I can leave that to a later program if, if there's interest in that. But this is the most decorated ship, the USS Rasher SS-269. Tonnage sank was 99,000. 901 tons. She ranked third in total tonnage sunk by an American submarine in World War II. She received the presidential unit citation. And as you can see, the, uh, the ships depicted that she sunk various ships during the time. And this was on uh, eight patrols. So she was a highly decorated ship. She survived World War II. And that is the last slide in this program. Uh, my information source for this is a book which I'll try to hold up correctly. Freshwater Submarines, A Manitowoc Story. Uh, not available in print today, but through ABE Books, 
Com or advancedbookexchange.com. You can uh, you can probably find the copy and get it. Very interesting. It was written by one of the captains of two of the Manitowoc subs who later became an admiral, Rear Admiral William T. Nelson, U.S. Navy, retired. So that's it at this point. I'll entertain questions on either of the two programs, and I thank you for your attention and time. Thank you. All right. So Barry, we do have uh, a few questions. Uh, one of the questions from Facebook. Are there any ships or military installations named after the four chaplains? There are various chapels around that are named after the four chaplains, uh, various parts of the country. Um, and was it common to have four chaplains on a ship? Uh, chaplains could be just about anywhere. The uh, Some images online that show the training class at Harvard for the chaplains, they were not just four guys that happened to train together at that time. There were numerous. It was like a, almost like a high school graduating class. So there were anywhere uh, faith was needed, uh, anywhere soldiers of any creed needed uh, religious comfort. They were there. They're still there. Uh, one of the videos I saw online, uh, a lot of the narration is done by current day chaplains and, and uh, learning about the four chaplains of the Dorchester is pretty much a recommended uh, course study with chaplains today. Um, this one is, uh, was the St. Lawrence Seaway ever used to move ships built on the Great Lakes during World War II? Uh, I can't speak to other ships. I think that was one of the recommendations of the president of the shipyard. They could go out that way, but that was uh, rejected. I, I think the, uh, the journey through the Great Lakes uh, has, has changed somewhat with improvements over the years. You know, keep in mind now that we're some uh, 75 to 80 years removed from World War II. So we've got another question in this. Um, uh, I'm uh, one of uh, they're surprised that there was a uh, very few rescued given the number of support ships around. Uh, and I believe that this is with the uh, as the Storchester was the high death rate uh, really just due to the speed of sinking. Well, the ship sank, I've heard as as quickly as 18 minutes, as long as 27 minutes. I don't think anybody was really paying too much attention to their watch at the time. The larger ship in the convoy, the Tampa, then escorted the two remaining troop ships off to Greenland. So she wasn't around. It was just the two smaller ships, the Comanche and the Escanaba that uh, were available to rescue ships. Keep in mind, it's completely dark. Uh, they're also trying to keep tabs or concerns over where this U-boat was. Could there be an additional sink? And the Escanaba indeed was sunk five months later, possibly by a German U-boat or, or hitting a mine that had been placed in the water. And the water was cold. A lot of these, these guys, there were really only two lifeboats that were in the water. The rest of the people who went to the water were floating. Some were afraid to jump off the ship. A number of people were killed with the torpedo hitting the side of the ship, which exploded uh, in a, a crew quarter or, or a passenger quarter area. So uh, 34 degree temperature. The uh, British battle cruiser hood, when it was sunk by the Bismarck, Three men survived from the sinking of that ship, which had 1,600 people on board. So cold water is our enemy. And we have another question here. Um, what army units were on board the Dorchester? Hmm? What army units? Uh, I can't speak to that. Uh, it would just be a total guess at my point right now. Uh, I think it could have been various units. Uh, these men, they did not know where they were going in New York. They knew they were just going into the war zone. Uh, another question, were there any ships leaving New Orleans sunk before they went on their first mission? You know, any? Uh, no submarine was sunk crossing the Gulf. In terms of a warship, I'm not sure about that. I'm sure some of the ships that sailed out of New Orleans, merchant ships that were sunk into the Gulf. Uh, keep in mind, virtually all of the ships sunk in the Gulf of Mexico in World War II was sunk after we got into the war in very late 1941 and through 1942 with uh, this, uh, this falling off uh, in 1943. Well, um, this, I think that is the end of our questions that we have right now. Um, so folks, I wanna thank you so much for um, coming in today and, and watching our wonderful program here with Barry Simon. Thank you so thank much, you. Barry, again. 
And uh, ladies and gentlemen, we will be uh, having our next Lunchbox Lecture. Uh, this is going to take place in October uh, on the 21st. This is going to feature Rick Jacobs. Uh, the program is going to be about the Munich Agreement uh, from Versailles to the Blitzkrieg. So we hope that you'll uh, be joining us next time. And again, thank you also to ARP, our sponsor for this program. Thank you all, and we'll see you next time. <laughs>